Hello everybody, Matt the Lesser here with episode number four of our Terra Mystica Fan Factions Basic Strategy Series. For those of you who are new, we are going through each of the new 14 fan factions for Terra Mystica, which are currently in beta testing on BGA and soon to be finalized and published and in your physical hand, but for right now, just on BGA. Um, but they've been out for enough that uh, it's time to start talking about how do we play these factions. So these videos are intended at folks who are familiar with the game of Terra Mystica, have played with the base factions, know all of the rules, the basic game mechanics, some of the uh, general strategies, but have not played the fan factions and are looking to do so for the first time. In the first three episodes, we already have talked about the conspirators, the architects, and the prospectors, uh, progressively getting slightly more complicated as we've gone along. And today we are delving into probably the most complicated one that we've covered yet, the Children of the Worm. Love this name, love this artwork, love the theme, love everything about it. And these guys are the Leech Masters themselves. And so today we're going to try to demystify them a little bit. They're actually not as complicated as one might think on their first faction, but there are a ton of nuances. And so we're going to try to talk about all of those. Um, if you're not familiar, I don't do video editing. So this is the no frills, one take, basic strategy overview, children of the worm. All right, let's go. So let's start as we always do with the board. So the children of the worm have what's mostly a pretty normal looking board, but there's a lot of small tweaks that you got to really make sure you spot. So normal looking dwelling production, normal looking trading post and temple sanctuary stronghold production. It's a four power stronghold, but nothing crazy out of the ordinary there. But first nuance to see with the children of the worm is that they have variable coin costs, not just on their trading posts like every faction does, but on all of their structures. So their dwellings cost one coin if you're building next to somebody and the normal two coins if you're not. Trading posts are normal, three, six. Trading posts vary four, which is one cheaper than normal if you're building it next to somebody, but eight nasty coins if you're trying to build it separately. And the big buildings are even worse. Five, the cheapest big buildings out there from a coin perspective, uh, if you have a neighbor, but if you don't, 10 coins a la the Fakir's stronghold, some of the most expensive big buildings in the game. So right off the bat, the costs are telling you, you want neighbors and you want to build next to people. And that only gets more important when you look at the Children of the Worms book ability, which has to do with Leech. So I call them the Leech Masters because they pay one fewer victory point for every Leech that they get. So still one for zero, that's normal, but they also get two for zero. So if you have a trading post and someone builds or upgrades next to it, you get to take two Leech for no victory points. Over the course of the game, if you are strategic about where you upgrade and predict and you're good at predicting your opponent's move, this can save you an absolute ton of victory points. Um, and that scales, by the way. So if it's three, you only lose one victory point, four, you only lose two, yada, yada, yada. Obviously, as always, it gets less efficient as you go up, but those two for zeros are just an absolutely beautiful thing that the children of the worm have here. The other part of their ability is not actually shown in their book. And if you're not looking closely, you may miss it because it's a part of the board that doesn't get an edit for any other faction. And that is if you look up here at their power pools, you'll notice that in the little icon about burning, where you normally it says throw away a token to move one token from bowl two to bowl three. Every faction can do this. You probably don't even look or think about it, but you see that the children of the worm have a little two there. And this is massive. So the children of the worm, when they burn, they can throw one token away and move two power tokens up into bowl three. This is extremely strong, extremely powerful, um, and creates some weird power token math that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But, uh, you know, don't forget this, right? Their ability to burn and move up, it actually allows, makes burning a production for them, right? You're actually generating resources instead of just trading off um, efficiency, uh, no, sorry, availability in the future capacity for uh, availability of tokens now, but you're actually generating resources as you move up, um, makes the power bulls imbalanced, it does all kinds of wacky stuff, um, but it's a really important part of the Children of the Worm's uh, ability. Um, finally, 
uh, normal shipping, normal digging, uh, water and earth starting cults, they do only start with 12 coins as opposed to the normal 15. That is to slightly offset the fact that on net, these split coin costs reduce the number of coins that they end up spending on buildings over the course of the game. So you got to offset that a little bit by giving them a few fewer to start. Um, and then finally, let's talk about this wonky looking stronghold. You're probably looking at this and be like, what the hell does this mean? So the stronghold, in addition to its four power income, does two things. Number one is when you build it, you immediately get to take all of the power tokens that you have burned and put them back into bull number one so that you get your capacity back. So especially for a faction that, as we just talked about, has a really powerful, cool burning ability, this is accentuates and synergizes really well with that. So basically you might already be realizing what you often do with the Children of the Worm is you burn a bunch of power tokens over the course of the game to take advantage of that ability. And then when you're getting low, you build a stronghold and bam, you've got them all back. It's a little bit actually like the Dragon Lords uh, in, that, in that fashion. The Children of the Worm are using the, uh, the tokens a little bit differently than the Dragon Lords, but it's basically like, let's get rid of them. And then when we need more, okay, let's get them back. Then additionally, the Children of the Worm have this button. Um, and this button, the, the stronghold brings in a completely different and unique aspect of the children that isn't actually related to much of what else they do. So, uh, except that it uses power tokens, uh, like everything, they're the leech masters. So when you hit this button, you're allowed to take two power tokens out of your bulls. You almost always want to take them out of bull one and put them on river spaces. They can be next to each other or not. It has to start by being adjacent to one of your buildings. Put them on river spaces on the board. And these allow you to directly connect your buildings, other people's buildings, whatever. Um, and it's a lot, it actually functions a lot like the mermaid's town token being placed in the river and then it connects those structures. But the difference is the mermaids can only do it when they're founding a town and they only do it with just the town token. The children of the worm can do it before they found the town or to found a town and they can string them along um, to create this path that connects all of the structures of their own that are along that path. They also get to leech off the whole path. So everything that's connected to it creates this one big leech party, which in my experience actually doesn't impact the game that much. The much bigger thing is using these t uh, tokens to connect and to form towns. So you can create these really kind of weird, uh, wonky looking towns. And we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more how you do that. But you do lose a little bit of capacity so that some tokens you might not be able to burn in the future. Um, but is another really cool facet of the Children of the Worm if you build the Stronghold. I would say the Children of the Worm are, are a faction with my favorite kind of Stronghold, which is the kind that is useful, can totally make your game in some games, and also can be totally done without in other games. I think you, they really have that flexibility. Okay, so there's the overview. Hopefully, I know there's a lot going on, on the board, but hopefully it's not too complicated. Um, so let's start talking about when do we want to play them. And before I even dive into the specifics, the first thing I'll say about the children is that they're a pretty flexible faction. I think that there's not a ton of things that they really need or really don't need. Um, they can work in a lot of different setups. So, you know, if they're in an auction, don't be afraid to bid on them because of the setup. I would say think much more about, what do we always say? The color wheel. Um, but maybe even more important than the color wheel in this particular instance with the children is the, the children want neighbors. And it's really important that you have them early. You want people that you can build next to, that you can upgrade next to, and are going to build an upgrade next to you to give you that leech back. You benefit more than them because of your free leeches and your lower building costs. So you really want neighbors. So look at the, the set of four factions that are in the game. Look at the map that you're playing on. We're going to talk about base map in just a second, but whatever map you're playing on, look at the map. Think about where players are going to start. And if the setup is such that black is going to have a lot of neighbors, that's a good time to play Children of the Worm. On base map, gray is a great faction for that. Um, we've talked about this before with when we talked about the conspirators, how gray and black have really nice synergy, especially on the Eastern continent. Um, on the flip side, most of the blue factions don't have good neighbor spots with black on 
uh, base map, so they are often ones you want to look, uh, watch out for, particularly also because a lot of the blue factions tend to be more of these isolationist factions, like the Swarmlings, the Wisps, the Atlanteans are all factions that often are not building and upgrading next to you very often. So if they are in the game, I would uh, be much more reticent to play the Children of the Worm. And then there are some other factions like Fakirs and others that kind of try to spread out all around the map and are less likely to feed you as much of that leech uh, as your, your concentrated factions like, uh, you know, the Engineers and the Prospectors. Those are great neighboring factions for uh, Children of the Worm. When we talk about the bonus tiles, we're going to talk about exactly why in a second, but trust my word, take my word for it, power tiles, really good for the Children of the Worm because of what it allows them to do both in, in round one and throughout the game. Power management, because of the leech and you're going to be moving power tokens around those bulls quite a lot, uh, is really important. And so having more tiles in the game that allow you to uh, shift those around is really helpful. Additionally, children do not have any natural way of making spades. They're gonna seek a lot of their spades through power actions. So power tile's good, and also the spade tile, very good for the children of the worm. I don't actually have any tiles that I would put in the bad category, whereas if it's like, this is in the game, that's really bad for the children of the worm. I actually, I really couldn't come up with any. But I would say that if these tiles that I have in the good are not there, like all three of them or even two of them, um, that's probably when, okay, maybe this is not as nice of a bonus tile set for Children of the Worm. So that's kind of how I would think about that. Um, as far as the round tiles, the scoring tiles, um, I think there's two main things to look for on the good side. One is early spades. Uh, Children of the Worm often get and often want double dig in round one, um, and they're often well positioned to do so. So if they can get uh, a spade uh, event in round one, that's really nice. Sometimes they can even get it round one and round two. Uh, so that spade event in round two, also really good. Um, they might want another, you know, whether if they don't get it in round one, they're gonna definitely want it in round two. So those early spade events are very good. Um, the TP event is also fine. Uh, Children of Worm can open double temple. We'll talk about that in a second. So a TP round is perfectly fine for that, but maybe even better is particularly, I've highlighted the water spade one here uh, because they often, if they get a priest, they can throw that to water with their water step and that spade uh, also very useful early for the Children of the Worm. Looking toward the mid and the late game with the children, having that stronghold big building event in round four or round five tends to really be the sweet spot for when you might wanna build that stronghold. You've burned a lot of tokens. You're thinking about how am I gonna connect up these uh, disparate clusters that I've got to form my towns. I need that stronghold token placement in the river ability. Round four, round five tends to be the perfect time to build a stronghold as the children of the worm. And usually after the stronghold event, is when you want the town event. So round six is always very good for that. Round five, also often very good because um, that's when you're gonna link up and complete those towns. So children really like late game town events. They also have a hard, hard time founding a town super early in the game. So for example, recently we talked about the architects who love to found a town in round one or round two. Children are the opposite. They'd much rather have those towns late in the game. And on the bad side, as I said, they're pretty flexible. They can adapt to a lot of different uh, scoring. So it's not like there's any uh, or too many things that are bad for them. The really the one is early big buildings. The children are not a faction. You don't want to open stronghold because you're not going to get nearly much use out of it. You're not going to open sanctuary. It's just a huge resource investment. Um, so round one, round two, big building tiles, something you're not going to take advantage of and other people are going to take advantage of. They also have fire and air coat rewards, which are the ones that you don't start on. Um, so that's kind of maybe the one big thing to avoid with the children as far as the setup goes. Okay, we know when to play them. Let's talk about the map. Uh, no stars here, uh, which I try, which I typically use to highlight, like you should always start on this spot or you should almost always start on this spot. If you've played black, any black faction, Darklings, Alchemists, whatever, on base map, you know black is one of the most flexible on base map in terms of starting spots. All five of these that I've highlighted with the yellow dots are totally viable starting spots for the children, just like they are for most black factions. And really the key decision here, as we talked about a couple minutes ago, is neighbors. Go where you're gonna get neighbors. Go where you're gonna get cheap upgrades and lots of leech that's really efficient for you. Um, so oftentimes that is one of these spots on the Eastern continent, uh, G5 and E10. And then on one of these spots over here in the East, C1 or E5. Um, B5 is 
sometimes a good important starting spot for black for connection purposes i would say if it's a game where you think you are not building your stronghold particularly b5 becomes more interesting or maybe if green is in the game or as they sometimes will start on c4 or get to it very early maybe they're you think they're going to go for a dwelling rush then b5 comes into play but i would say most games one of these eastern ones and one of the uh, western ones and yes you're going to have to find a way to connect and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second um, but these are typically great spots for black and for children that will get a lot of leech and give you lots of neighbors. Um, children also can ship around and, and take advantage. Like you want to seek your blacks um, as, as the children because you don't have natural spades like a lot of the other black factions do. Um, Double East, by the way, is not something I personally have tried with Children of the Worm. I'm not a fan of it as Darklings or Alchemists. Um, I think with the Children, it could work because of how much leech you get, um, but it's imperative that you, one, think you can secure G6 later in the game to make sure that you connect or you think you can kind of get around, and also that you think you can get out because um, children do have a pretty high network capacity in general. They can build a lot of structures, especially with those reduced costs if they can find neighbors all over the map. Um, and often if you hem yourself into double east, your network uh, potential gets limited. So I would say uh, do it with caution, just like you would with the Darklings or the Alchemists. Um, and if I try it, maybe I'll report back later in the comments and, and tell y'all how it went, but I haven't done it yet. Okay, we know where to place... We've placed our opening dwellings. Let's talk about openings. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different than a couple of the other ones in that the, the openings that Children of the Worm have are pretty standard um, for sort of normal factions in, in Terra Mystica. Most of the time, you're either going to most of the time you're going to open with a temple and some dwellings, however many you can get out. Um, Children of the Worm, as we mentioned, have uh, very easy access to double dig. Um, and this is because, and I'm going to, I'm going to cheat here and go over to my, the right side of my slide here with the tactics, which is that because of their burn ability, the ability to toss, to get two tokens from bowl two to bowl three, every time you toss one away, they actually have access to double dig as soon as they have nine power tokens in bowl two. Every other faction, your orientation is, oh, I need 12 power tokens in bowl two so I can burn six of them, move six up, or better, right? Some in bowl two plus some in bowl three. Um, and then I have enough for double dig, but with children, the math is different. You only need nine and you can still have three even sitting in bowl one. This is only two power away from what they start with. They're a five, seven starting faction. Uh, so if you take a power tile as children, even though you're a five, seven faction, you instantly have access to double dig. And especially if you're playing in a game with a lot of the fan factions, uh, which most of which actually don't have early access to double dig, um, you are often going to be in a really good position to get that uh, double spade action in round one. And trust me, you want it. It's really good. Um, so temple plus three dwellings, your, your initial dwelling plus the two more you get off double dig is a very common, very standard opening for the children of the worm. You can do it with uh, worker power is probably your most preferred tile. You can obviously also do it with temp ship or even ship scoring. Um, Sometimes you can do it with the priest or even with any other tile if uh, you know if there if there aren't many power tiles in the game and and, and you're getting early leech because uh, again you would only need to pick up two leech set or say you send you take the priest tile and you send your priest to a cult and you only need one more leech you're gonna place next to people because your children are the worm that's what you want to do um, or even if you upgrade once you can get one of those free two for zeros and on your second action if you think double dig's still gonna be there you can uh, take it. So that's my uh, recommendation for most openings with the Children of the Worm. They obviously, if they get the Spade Tile, great, go for that. Uh, temple and two dwellings off of the Spade Tile, potentially into like a round two double dig, also really strong. Or maybe you take the Spade Tile uh, and you do Temple and two dwellings and you take the Priest Power Action and send Priest to a Cult. Again, all viable under the Temple plus dwellings opening. And when would you want to do this? Honestly, any time is fine, but particularly uh, if the spade action or the dwelling action are there, that much of a better reason to build uh, temple plus dwellings. As I mentioned earlier, children can also open double temple. Um, what, there's a couple reasons to do this. One is if you think double dig for some reason might get taken before you, maybe you have mermaids in front of you and they got ship scoring and you know that's just gonna be what it's gonna be. Um, uh, double temple also if there's a temple scoring round obviously TP scoring round could be quite good um, 
And the other reason that Double Temple is good is because uh, it, it tends to push you to upgrade faster. And those two for zeros, even three uh, that you get off of both the TP and the Temple are really strong and you're just gonna generate a ton of leech and you might be able to get some power actions back. Uh, I actually have seen a couple games where people were able, actually able to open Double Temple plus a dwelling by starting with worker power um, and also getting both the worker's action and the spade action because they got so much leech that they uh, were then able to place all of those things. Um, one thing to note with Double Temple that I've written here is remember, you only start with 12 coins, so you do have to find two extra coins, but that's just one burn. All you gotta do is burn <laughs> one uh, token, either you get two more, so obviously beyond any power actions that you take, um, but say you started with, for example, the big building tile that gives you your two workers, you're already there, um, but just do remember you are gonna have to find some extra coins. Um, the, the priest tile plus the worker's action also works really well, um, especially if you've got, for example, that water spade reward that we've talked about previously. Um, but again, I wouldn't open Stronghold, definitely. I wouldn't open Sanctuary. Black on base map, can do a dwelling rush, but it's pretty tricky. I would say stay in the comfort zone, mostly temple dwellings, double dig, or in some circumstances, double temple is probably what you wanna think about. Um, but in addition, and this is where I said it's a little different from what we've talked about before, is there are some specific tactics that you wanna think about with the children in round one, um, more so than just what you're opening. So number one is we already talked about the math to do double dig, but that also applies to other power actions, right? To get four tokens, for example, into uh, rat, into bowl, wow, I can't do math. Four tokens into bowl three, you only need six tokens in bowl two. So keep keep that in mind. Remember, you only have to throw away two and then you can move four up and that would allow you to take single spade, workers, coins, whatever. So keep that um, burning math in mind. Also, if you don't have to take your power action yet, go ahead and upgrade because that leech that you get off the TP is infinitely better than the leech you're getting off the dwelling because it's a two for zero instead of a one for zero. Now, for every faction early in the game, you'd rather have a two for one than a one for zero, but it's that much better for Children of the Worm because you don't even have to give up the victory point. So prioritize getting those more valuable leeches uh, as quickly as possible. Another slightly trickier one is if you wanna build a dwelling, say one off of one of your spades from Double Dig, for example, um, if you think you're gonna get a neighbor next to that spot, but they're not there yet, you might think about waiting until they build that dwelling, because remember, your dwelling costs one coin less if you build it next to somebody else versus if you build it on its own, it's the normal two coin cost. Um, so just think about that um, when you're thinking about the ordering of which you might build your dwellings versus upgrading, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, uh, as far as favorite tiles go, I highly recommend an Econ favor tile with Children of the Worm. Um, I know they don't have inherent scoring, um, but they also don't have inherent spades or uh, a stronghold that gives some sort of economic boost. Like they, they really do need the economic, uh, the economic help. And so I would say most of the time, Fire One or Earth Two are your best friend. You know, if it's a spade round, Take that Earth 2, which is going to give you more workers and the extra coins from the spade reward. Um, if it's a lower coin game, which Children of the Worm can do totally fine in low coin games because they're low coin costs, but Fire 1 is probably a good um, example there. And because your, your temples are cheap, right, and priests are good in general, get that second temple up in round 2 or round 3 or round 1 if you go double temple, but round 2 or round 3, take your scoring favor then um, and you'll be totally fine. That econ will more than pay off uh, over the course of the game in terms of network and just being able to build stuff where you wanna build. Uh, the final word of caution I'll note here is be careful with air two. Um, you know, if there's an air reward and you wanna go for it or no one else is taking air two, like, okay, I'm not gonna say never do it, but here's the issue. You burn a lot of tokens with Children of the Worm and Power Man management is crucial. It's really easy to find yourself in round three or round four overproducing um, or even producing to a fact where you have most of your power in bowl three and you can't take full advantages of those leeches with like the first action of the round before you're able to down convert, um, which it often just leads to inefficiency with the children of the worm. And a lot of the time, if you're playing well, playing the children of the worm well, you'll be getting enough leech that you will have access to the power actions 
that you want. Air 2 is often really valuable if like everyone's kind of dispersed and there's not a lot of leech getting passed around in the game and that Air 2 is really gonna fuel you getting a lot of the power actions. If that's the state of the game, honestly, like you shouldn't be playing Children of the Worm in the first place. Um, and so I would, I would highly, in most cases, stay away from Air 2. I think it's gonna make your power management more tricky. Um, so never say never, but be careful if you want to. Okay, now we've opened, moving on. Let's talk about what to keep in mind as we're going through the rest of the game with the children. And the first one, I would say, is one of the most important ones, as I alluded to before, burn, baby, burn. Like, children of the worm, burning is producing resources. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. Um, in fact, one of the things that this implies is, and I'm not gonna do the math like live, but go check it for yourself. I promise you it's right. It is more valuable for the children of the worm to move power from bull one to bull two than it is to move it from bull two to bull three, as long as they have capacity to burn. Um, and this is because basically of that ability that you're moving two up for every one that you throw out, whereas normally it's an equal spread. So one thing to think about is if you think you're gonna be getting enough leech basically in between one turn and the next turn or in between the round and the next round, such that um, you're gonna to have to start taking leeches that are moving power from bull two to bull three, it might actually behoove you to move power from bull three to bull one just in straight like coin conversions, for example, even if you still have capacity. Most of the time with factions, you only wanna do that when you're basically full in bull three and you couldn't accept the leech at all. But if that, if moving some down will actually allow you to accept a bull one to bull two leech as opposed to a bull two to bull three leech, that actually is better production for the children of the worm. And especially if you're gonna build your stronghold, don't be afraid to burn way down. I mean, obviously get your double spade early, maybe even two double spades early, but if you need to go below six down in round three, cause you're gonna build a stronghold in round four, like totally fine. Every token that you haven't successfully burned and moved two up by the time you build your stronghold is resources wasted. That's basically production that you're never gonna get back. An ideal scenario, honestly, is you have like two tokens left uh, at, the, at the end when you build your stronghold. It, in practice, you're probably never gonna actually get that low, but that's the ideal um, because you, it literally is generating you new resources as you move up to bull three. Okay, I think I've hammered that point home enough. Um, also with the children, one of the reasons that they're tricky to master is that you really need to be able to anticipate what your neighbors or not, or neighbors and your opponents are going to do. Uh, you want to figure out where they're going to build, where they're going to upgrade, and make sure you're positioning yourself to take advantage of those lower coin costs uh, and those cheap conversions. Black on base map, for example, we've talked about this before, have the ability to upgrade their ship and build up all these dwellings over here. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it if you have to pay two coins per dwelling, but how much better is it if you only have to pay one coin per dwelling because you waited one extra round for a yellow to do their shipping spree first, as an example, right? Um, so really think about that. Um, make sure you upgrade when um, you're gonna get leech back. Make sure you wait when you're gonna get uh, lower costs. Um, and you can really, really get your economy rolling with Children of the Worm. They need a lot of leech uh, for, it, for it to all kind of come together. Um, on the stronghold specifically, so we talked about how round four, round five is the sweet spot, how you wanna have burned as much as you can before you build it back. But once you actually have it, using that, let's talk about using that button. Um, this stronghold is actually really, really helpful at creating creative towns uh, in spots that normally you couldn't do. You have to think like the mermaids, as I said, but like even bigger, um, and sometimes can even allow you to solve connection. So like, as an example, one of my favorite towns with the Children of the Worm are these four hexes. E5, E4, H5, and H4, connected by four power tokens on these four river hexes down here. Why is this amazing? Well, number one is it's four hexes for only two spades, H4 and E4, which is awesome. Um, number two is it connects you. Um, you don't have to worry about, black often has this thing where they need to fight to either try to steal D5 or 
beat red or yellow to B4, um, or if they're connecting through the south, they either have to get like H3 or I4 to enable this three ship connection. This solves all of those problems. You can successfully, for example, start G5, E5. All you have to do is get two ships. So you can get down to H5 and H4, and then bam, it takes it does take two rounds, right? So you have to make sure you build your stronghold on time to get those down. But that's an example of a great town that only the children of the worm can make and also solves your connection problem. The Children of the Room Stronghold can also be really useful in connecting E5, which also often gets isolated here. Um, it's sometimes it's very hard as black to build a town off of E5. You can connect it up this way to C1 and these much more friendly stretches over here or over here to B3. I've seen four uh, power tokens placed on these four river stretches in the north connecting A8, B3, and E5 all together as part of one town along with what just one other hex, maybe A7 or B2, or in more simply, you know, even one token will connect C1 over here. Um, you know, at its very simplest, it can avoid you having to build a bridge, but at its best, uh, this ability can really do a lot more. Um, so see where you're building, go find the places with neighbors to build and upgrade and get all of that leech. And then when you get to round four, round five, think, how do I connect these up in the way that's gonna be efficient and allow me to form the most towns? Children of the Worm can form three towns in many, many games because of their uh, ability to connect up these structures. The one thing you do have to think about, I mentioned it briefly, is make sure you build it on time. You only get to place two per round. So if you look and you say, hey, I'm gonna need six tokens to make these towns that I wanna make, make sure you build your stronghold by round four or you're not gonna be able to get the chance to place um, six tokens. Uh, and finally, with that ability, um, it makes getting your blacks that much more important because you can connect them up and you don't need to dig as much. So like, don't triple dig stuff as Children of the Worm. There's really no reason to because you can often just sort of circle around it. Um, like, much more rarely than with any other faction will you need that one key hex because you can just find another one and then use some tokens to go attach it to the hexes that you already have. Um, so they're a really fun faction to play because of this creativity that you have and these optionality that you have that a lot of other factions don't have. It's very hard to hem them in in the way that you can with other factions. Um, if you're playing against them, what you want to do is just basically stay away from them and starve them of leech and they will, you know, wither. <laughs> uh, but, if, but if they get a lot of leech, they're a really strong faction and sort of going to my, you know, overall assessment of the Children of the Worm, I think they are a very strong faction. I've seen them do very well in a lot of different setups. I think they're pretty resilient. I think they're pretty flexible. I do think they are a faction that accentuates stronger players. Um, so uh, the first couple games you play with them, uh, especially if you're newer to the game of Terra Mystica in general, you might find it a little bit tricky. You might find some of this burn math a little complicated, especially in a live game. It's sometimes easy to miss things that are available to you, but keep playing them. You'll get better. Um, and they're a really fun, fun faction. Um, oh, and I didn't mention that, yeah, high network faction. They can often get a lot of dwellings out, especially if they have neighbors. One worker and a coin for a dwelling is just amazing. And cults, they're kind of in the middle. They do tend to er build early temples. Um, so they often do have priests, but they don't really have any other cult orientation beyond that. So if they want to send a lot of priests to the cults, they can. Um, they can compete, particularly if there are earth and water rewards. Um, but they're not, you know, going to compete with like true cult factions out there. Um, so that's the Children of the Worm, um, one of my favorite of the fan factions. I love playing around with the burn. I did like this whole deep dive on the burn bat that was so much fun. Um, but anyways, let me know how your games with them go in the comments. Come find me on BGA um, and we will see you back next time for another episode when I get around to it. Um, until then, see you later.